And uh, I have to admit that I'm under a bit of pressure here uh, because I've been presenting twice uh, for many of you. Uh, and uh, now I have to, to present uh, some uh, once again, but at least some of it will be, uh, you, you will recognize some of the, the, the points that I'll make tonight. Um, but as you said, Camilla, this is about the ritual life among the Hadza. And uh, the reason you had, you had this wonderful presentation, because exactly that's the reason why I chose this title, was that um, not many work in this, in this area. Um, and it's, uh, we find uh, that the Hadza is a very, very prominent group in the research, in anthropological research. Uh, and they are so because they are interesting uh, evolutionarily uh, and also linguistically. Uh, they speak this uh, language which is an isolate, meaning that it's not in family with any other language. Um, so, and because they have these ancient DNA, DNA uh, people tend to, to, to look to the Hatsa to open this window into the past of our common ancestry. And um, so that's, those are some of the reasons that people study the Hatsa, is to gain uh, an understanding about where we all come from, where, what is our common human origin. Um, and many of the questions that has been asked working with the Hatsa has been uh, questions about technology, uh, also, you know, how do they hunt? Which technology do they use? Uh, where do they stand technologically in, for instance, relation to Tasmanians uh, that are very simple technologically speaking? And, you know, we have all these scales that people are, are investigating to see. Uh, and they come to the, to the Hatsa with these kind of questions. Uh, so technology is one of them. Economy is another one. Uh, how come? Um, well, they are uh, hunter gatherers, and they do live this uh, system called uh, immediate return, developed by James Woodburn, and uh, it's a very unusual uh, way of uh, organizing and or living. Um, because it's only found among hunter-gatherers, but not even all hunter-gatherers have or live by this um, immediate return system. Uh, and the, yeah, very, very, very briefly, is just to say that instead of um, you know uh, putting a grain into the soil, first preparing the soil, putting the grain in, being, having all this labor going on. Uh, and then waiting uh, to to get the the spoils of of the labor. Immediate returners start with nothing, go and get it right away. So it's there's no storage. Uh, it's uh, this way of uh, going out and uh, uh, have the 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 produce immediately from the labor. So any other kinds of uh, you know, wage labor is also delayed. Uh, agriculturalists delayed. All these uh, other systems are, are typically delayed uh, return systems. Um, so that's another. Uh, oh yeah, maybe I should say that the, it was just that Chris asked me also to make this an introduction to the Hatza, right? So that's also why I try to. I'm just walking a bit around presenting now uh, how, how is it that the Hatsa have been um, what role have they had in, in uh, research uh, what questions has been asked through them with their case so it's just to, to so that we will find why we end up with ritual life uh, at the end so that's, that's what's going on um, so yes, we came to to economy uh, with the immediate return system. That's one very uh, prominent thing that is uh, uh, also investigated through the Hatsa case. 
um, but also a sharing economy uh, known from many other hunter-gatherer uh, systems uh, both with the equal uh, meat sharing practices why do why do these people share what they value so highly why do they share equally the meat that is uh, that is hunted by the hunter why doesn't he keep it to, to himself uh, these questions are asked over and over and we have all these uh, you know uh, both moral and uh, you know, different different kind of answers uh, given to this uh, this key question, but it has been going on for decades, uh, trying to solve this puzzle. Um, and another aspect is also the demand sharing. Why? How how does it work that people actually uh, can ask for other people to share what they have? So if you have. Uh, relative affluence, I'm entitled and I have the moral upper hand to go and ask you, share your, share your paper, you've got enough, you know? It's, it's a way to, to, uh, to claim the right and to have the moral upper hand in asking other people to share, which, so it's not a begging, it's not, a, uh, we have got all these uh, other uh, ideas about asking to for people to share um, that doesn't apply here. So, um, evolutionary uh, questions are asked about uh, to the Hatsa, also e economical questions, and also, uh, lastly, I would say the political questions, uh, because the Hatsa is one of the groups that display the highest degree of egalitarian uh, egalitarianism so we have we have a system of people that uh, where both men and women are very uh, equal with equal rights and equal say in the in in questions of society they have equal possibilities to to influence this and uh, James Woodburn also wrote a wonderful article in in uh, 81 about this and uh, it's some of these questions are really uh, gaining momentum these years too uh, so how how come uh, how did we why did we come from an egalitarian past and develop this highly hierarchical system uh, later on what 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 happened? What is the logic? And would we all like to go back to or forward to more egalitarian uh, systems? Uh, so these are the things: evolutionary questions, economic questions, political questions that are primarily, and technological questions that are primarily asked with the Hatsa case in mind. But these questions about, okay, but what goes on inside? What's, uh, what's, on, what's the imagination? What's, uh, how do they see the world? How do they see themselves in the world? And not just as stereotypical people performing their roles in society. Um, that's really something that has been left out of uh, many accounts. Um, and I think that uh, at least that was something that, that I needed to to uh, ask. I didn't go directly to this. Uh, I didn't jump to to ritual life uh, from my my uh, armchair and just oh I'll go and explore this. Uh, rather, I'm I have I could say um, I'm a, a curator at a, a museum in Denmark. And uh, my angle into this research was that uh, I had read uh, James Woodburn's uh, catalogue from the British Museum in 1970. Uh, it was a catalogue uh, uh, around his uh, collection and it's, it had just had this curious mention of uh, three objects that were uh, termed children 
objects that were children, how does this match to all this technological, economical, political, uh, very hard, hardlining uh, descriptions? So uh, this was the crack that I, this, uh, that I wanted to explore. And through this, through these three, three kinds of objects, I came to, I landed splash into ritual life. So, uh, so that's, that's how we got to this point. And tonight, um, we're going to talk about, well, therianthropes and dancing dead, uh, and also having animals as kindred spirits. How can we, how do people see themselves as in relation, uh, family relation ties even, uh, with uh, animals, and what does it mean? Um, yes, this means that we're going to see uh, therianthropes is this mixture between man and animal. Uh, so these are beings, hybrid beings, uh, of, that has both an, uh, a human side or aspect as well as a, an animal aspect uh, within them. And the dancing dead we meet at this epime, uh, ritual, night dance ritual that we're going to just uh, have a hearing about also. And uh, this uh, relationship with animals is the last point. Um, but let's get to the, the card. The, we always have to have a card, right? Saying, where are we in the world? And here we are. It's just in the northern part of uh, Tanzania. Near, uh, well, I'll go closer. Um, or oh, maybe I should just say we have the Rift Valley here going down and we are in the Rift Valley area uh, and and here we've got did you see it? Did I just jump too quickly? Let me just go back up here we have the, the lake that we are uh, that we'll find on the next slide and this is Lake Iyasi and it's, uh, even though Tanzania is almost a th thousand, uh, one million square kilometers large, this area that the, that the Hatsa live in is only 4,000 square kilometers. So it's a, a very small area uh, in the large uh, land that Tanzania is. And here, uh, you probably would would recognize the here's the Ngorongoro crater it's just up here and up here uh, we've got um, Serengeti plain so and this is uh, where I did my field work was around let me just have a look here um, and that's in the in the uh, Yaida Chini area, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, far away from. There's also people living here, but that's uh, and that's closer to to the tourist track, uh, going from from um, Arusha to Serengeti, uh, and also quite a lot of people come as tourists to see the performance by the Hatsa in this area. But this is definitely more off the track. There are only three roads going to this uh, area in total, so it's quite uh, it's quite difficult to to get near and to get to. Um, this is one of the roads that leads to the area, and this is in the rainy season. So we've got an area that is uh, can very easily be flooded in the rainy season and it's scorching hot uh, in the in the dry season with these winds swirling around and just drying you up uh, so it's a very rough area to be in and it's considered to be you know not fit for human beings to to live in 
it's it's got also it's a sets of fly infected area so it's a uh, it's quite uh, rough and that's also why the huts are still has this uh, area even though people are moving there uh, to a larger degree um, and here we have a picture of uh, the hunters uh, only men hunt and that's a quite uh, it's a, an important thing that only that men and women have different roles in society even if though they are egalitarian uh, they have different chores or different roles that they they perform and uh, men has the role of uh, being hunters and women do not um, here we've got a picture of uh, a roasting of a you know only women know how to 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 dig for the tubers and roots so this is and it's only Hatsa women who know this no other pe no other group uh, women or men would know how to do this and it's highly skilled it's such a powerful thing to do and to be successful in uh, and here we see we've just pulled the roots that we got that afternoon and uh, are eating them straight from the from the bonfire and men and women do know how to and, and do uh, when they are out pick uh, fruits on their way and drink whatever they come by so it's also a way you know you when you go out that's when you feel not hungry that's when you feel replenished that's uh, staying home in the in the camp that's where the hassle is and that's also quite a different uh, you know mindset about being home it's not a comf comforting place it's a uh, more demanding to stay at home really uh, yeah um, and here we also see that uh, this woman she has a carrying kanga it, and that's just to she will eat just a uh, you know standing there for maybe one minute quickly just taking some berries and uh, eating them right away but also just tossing in uh, some in this uh, kanga that she will bring back home so but the most is uh, eaten right away as an immediate returner would do All right. Now we get to these um, to the question about uh, ritual life, because here we have a picture of these uh, bells. They're used by so many people in ritual or just in performances. Uh, and so, so what would be so special about these? The special thing about these is that they are also part of the rituals. Uh, they're part of the Epimen night dance ritual, and they're part of the Maitoko and the Maito rituals of um, that are initiation rituals for adolescent uh, people. Um, and if we just remember that that the story about the Hatsa has been that they have been projected as our primitive past. They've been this window into our past. It's been our most primitive version uh, of ourselves. Uh, I think that this story about the rituals is really uh, putting a question mark to this primitivity. Uh, it's uh, it's so highly evolved. It has got all these very uh, delicate structures around it. So um, I think that that's also why it's so important to remember this aspect of human beings uh, that they're not just this these. Uh, hunters and these gatherers and they perform like that uh, and they've got they 
they organize by these rules. No, they also have an inner life. Uh, so, um, yeah, and that's uh, that's a point that is it's strange to have to make this point, right? It's uh, we, we're in 2017. It's yes, of course we know that. Why 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 is it? Why should it be necessary to to say this? Uh, but if you read about, if you read the articles, the books that are presented about the Hatsa, uh, you will find that there is this strain that they, they, they have. Uh, they tend to oversimplify this people, um, and it's a, uh, it's this a. Uh, the consequences of this, because the state, the government, is not really uh, that happy to have this Stone Age population living in the midst. It's just this uh, annoyance. Why don't they evolve? Why don't they take the 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 hand that the government stretch uh, gives to them, saying, "Please have some uh, some seeds and." Start, plow, uh, yeah. Start your agriculture. You know, it's simple. Just go ahead with it. We'll help you. And they just refuse again and again. And this is really an annoyance. And the government has this uh, reaction of being more and more. Uh, uh, and yes, annoyed and, and thinking that, well, if they're not going to take our help, we'll stop offering it. Uh, so, so uh, when the the research literature also uh, gives this impression that this people is really so primitive, it's uh, also something that substantiates and that would strengthen the this attitude uh, from the administrative uh, side. So it's really, it does have consequences. Right, now we, I'm just going to play a short audio clip. Uh, I'm going to present a bit about uh, the Epime night dance ritual. Um, I'm going to present just briefly some of the rituals that uh, the Hatsa uh, do have and this first one uh, is taking place in the darkness. We could. Yes, <laughs> it takes place in the really pitch darkness and it's, uh, it's supposed to, to be like that we have only women on one side and men on the other side but that's okay we can st stay mixed <laughs> um, but this is a uh, this is a very powerful ritual and it takes time sev it takes time maybe twice every month uh, so it's something that really goes on uh, a lot of you know it's repetitive it's go you, they do it all the time keeping this ritual alive and uh, and pulsing it has this pulse about it it follows the moon uh, which is also this cosmological pulse that is uh, that is uh, set by the planets um, so we have this night which is uh, completely dark all the 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 fires are extinct and nobody uh, carries a torch or anything that is that gives out light uh, it's supposed to be non-visible it's supposed to be something that is that uses we, where we use the other senses you can f feel you, you feel also the closeness of the people beside you you feel it stronger when it's dark and when you're not having the visual to 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 give you all these ordinary impressions and you hear things more clearly when it's dark too and uh, this so this ritual is not a spectacle 
but it's a ritual that is supposed to, to that communicates through primarily sound. And uh, it, this is also something you will, you should really not uh, accept to see a video of this uh, of this ritual because it's uh, it's too completely tabooed to to make uh, videos of it. But sound is fine, so that's the closest we get to this uh, is uh, through sound. and the women respond So what we had just heard was uh, we should imagine to be here in, a, in this uh, dance clearing uh, and men on the one side, women on the other and they're divided by this uh, uh, hut or, or cliff or something that will prevent uh, the two groups to see each other uh, but, they can, but they can easily hear each other. So we ha hear that the, the first thing that will happen is that a dance will be initiated by whistles. Uh, from the men's side there will be these whistles and you hear the women respond uh, and they have to, f they will decode, oh who is this dance for? And they do convey this through a whistled language that is understandable, not to me, uh, unfortunately, but, but to the women. Um, and they, so they say, they recognize, oh, this is a dance for this and this person. And uh, they will, once the women find out, oh yes, this is for that person, they will start to sing and clap. And the man who is, um, uh, he comes from this other side into the dance clearing and uh, he will uh, be wearing a tall headdress of ostrich feathers that he will wave like this and he will have uh, these uh, calabashes, small calabashes that he can rattle and he will, he will be uh, obscuring his body shape with the with the cloth, uh, so that he's he, he shouldn't be recognizable. The plan is that they shouldn't know which man is performing this. He has turned into something else. He's turned into this therianthrope. He's turned into this being that is both human and animal. And he stands on the threshold between the living and the dead, and between women and men he can turn into a person carrying forward women's spirits. Uh, so that's a very powerful figure, this epime that is called. Uh, and he, uh, it's a uniting uh, feeling being present in, in this uh, ritual. They have such care that they perform this ritual every month that is to ensure that they have this uh, uh, connectivity, this, uh, that they feel each other strongly uh, in the families. 
So it's a it's a very powerful uh, ritual, and um, and it de de definitely drives on on this. Uh, um, on, you know, on transgressing the divides uh, that are otherwise in place. And now, when we have this darkness where we are here, uh, it's also something to consider that, uh, well, wouldn't it be nice sometimes to have a ritual where we can actually face and confront the things that we. Uh, are supposed to to avoid at all costs that we should never be in touch with. Uh, we've got these uh, all these stories like Eve and the apple. Uh, whenever there's something that you're told, you cannot do that. It's it's a an urge. You find this urge inside of you to to go do it, and um, that's also part of the ritual life. Uh, that's exactly to have this this space, this time, this technology to actually have the possibility to get in touch, to face what you are not supposed to face, to to engage with what you consider the most potent or dangerous or uh, anything that is that transgresses in the norms that you otherwise live by. So uh, I think that's, that's also something that we can see uh, through the Hatsa case is that maybe we do need these rituals. Maybe we do need to have an institution that allows us to, to work with this urge that we have to, to, to get in touch with all this, these taboos that we set up around us. Um, because I don't think that there has ever been a taboo uh, or something that is described as uh, illegal or uh, you, you, you cannot do that, that you shouldn't get in touch with that without the also being transgressions of that rule. Uh, so there is some kind of uh, of need to to mediate these these things. Right. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> this is bright. <laughs> um, Matthias Gunther uh, has been doing some wonderful stuff in the Kalahari. Uh, and he wrote about the Kung that they, they seem untroubled mentally and emotionally by such cosmological and logical incongruities as humans merging identities with the animals of myth and world. And that's also what we see in this, uh, in this epimid night dance. There's this uh, fluent and uh, it's unproblematic there's nobody saying, but that can't be. It's not right. How can you be both human <laughs> and animal, or, or neither? It's uh, oh, explain this to me. Um, but this is uh, something that uh, that is. He, he's got some really wonderful uh, descriptions about uh, also meat and and these wonderful. Uh, Rituals uh, that that uh, really correspond nicely with uh, so many of the Hatsa cases too. Um, and what we are seeing here is one of those animals that they merge with. Um, the Hatsa would merge uh, in a particular way, in a special way, in a kindred kind of way with. Uh, the eland, and uh, if um, I have a picture here, this is an eland. It's a huge animal. It's bigger than a, than a, a buffalo. It's a, uh, it can be quite. Uh, this is just from the internet, though. I, I don't have permission to to do this, but this is <laughs> sorry. Um, 
but this is the materiality that we are dealing with. These animals are huge. Uh, and actually, Lewis Williams and Beasley have a quite wonderful description of, uh, of the of Eland too, and they write um, on this. The Kung wax eloquent on the subject of the fat of an Elan bull. There's so much fat around the heart, they say, that two or three people are required to carry it. When it is smelted down, it is necessary to make a large receptacle of the Elan skin to contain it all. The heart, together with the surrounding fat, may be of such a size that it's impossible for a man to put his arms around it. So this is really what we're dealing with. This is the myth of the strength and of the fat and of the meat of the eland. Um, and back to this interview with the, these two Epime men. Uh, I would ask them about when they go on hunt uh, with the, uh, on, on elands, what, what is going on? And uh, they would say, uh, if I would go on hunt and I had shot an eland, I could not come back to camp and say that I shot an eland. I would say I had shot a lion, sesame, or bells in Garipite. Because when the eland walks, it makes the sound of the bells. The bells that were also heard in the dance before. These are the mimic of the eland sound. To say the Elan's name Komat is really bad, and I, me, is, I'm Tia, T. Uh, the Elan is very special, very, very, very special. Oh, 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 I cannot even say its name. Um, and just, uh, I just cut out some beat bits of the interview, but we would uh, talk about the hunt and the special rules applying to the hunt. Uh, and how they would need to seek help of Epime, other Epame people to to uh, trace the dead uh, eland. Uh, but now we are back to having traced the eland as it lies there in in the bush. So even we just we come to the place now they find the eland and they say even though they are very excited they. Uh, the, the old men do not talk if they talk the fat will disappear mm. and they cannot pass the head oh, and to pass around the elan's head when it lies like it's sleeping like that it's absolutely bad they go around to butcher the meat of the eland and when all has been cut they will call for the others waiting there to come to get pieces of meat they will never go around the elan's the head of the eland resting there while cutting because if they pass around the head they get huge problems, without doubt. They will be sick when they return to camp and they will not be able to even consider eating the meat of the eland. Mm. Not any meat of the eland. And it will be like that for a long time because the eland is from the Hatsa spirits. And th this description about not going through or pass passing the, uh, uh, the head of a dead animal, it just resembles so much the way that uh, it was described to me that if a person falls, you know, uh, if, if he dies and he lies there on the ground, you cannot pass the head. Uh, you will have to go in another way around. So I said, oh, I th I'm thinking about a dead person. Um, and they said, yes, to go around the head is bad. Elan is like that. It's important because the Elan is the sound or the voice of the Hatsa spirits. It's a big story, that one. And I keep on going. So it's like a person? You cannot go around the head? Yes, you cannot. Because if you go around the head, you'll get dreams of the dead man. And the Elan is like the dead man. It's very important, that animal, for the Hatsa. When the Elan is shot, we will initiate three boys for Maito because it's a powerful animal and it's got a lot of fat. Yes, it's a very big story. We'll not finish it now. But the other one keeps on going. The alien spirit from the Hatsa spirits since ancient times. Ah, the story is much richer than this, dear. I will tell you more later. But the eland is so powerful. There's no other animal like the eland. And he goes on. The eland is like a man of other people for Hatsa. 
Oh, it's like another person or I ask. Yes, it's very important. It's a Hatsa spirit. Now you know the big story of the eland. So <laughs> this is how an interview would go up and down and somebody else would just keep on giving cues and the other one tried to put it to rest but this is how it goes. Um, but this is uh, really important to, to, to have this information because that's also something that really opens up a whole area of, uh, of research, of symbolic uh, research that has not been dealt with um, and it's, it can inform so many discussions, uh, this one, so it's, uh, it's quite uh, good. Um, let me just have a look. Oh, when was it? 15 minutes, more minutes. 15, good. That's excellent. Sorry, or 20. Or 20. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, oh. Oh, I've got something going on here. Uh, the, I don't know what is this. Right. Um, I put this on. Uh, this is a quote uh, provided by Marshall Salins where he quotes another guy. Uh, oh God! So it's uh, uh, not really that nice uh, then. But um, I think that this is uh, is key to what we are dealing with here. Uh, Marshal Salins quote uh, Hogarth when saying oh, that he says, "Men divide themselves into two groups in order that they may impart life to one another, that they may intermarry, compete with one another." Make offerings to one another, and to do so, uh, do, to do, <laughs> and to do to one another whatever is required by their theory of prosperity. And I think that this is really a uh, key, uh, because why is it that the Hatsa operate with these rituals where they invite all these others in kind of the living? In, merging with the dead, the w men merging with the women, uh, the, the humans merging with the animals. Uh, I think that the, this quote uh, gives an idea about how we need, as human beings, we need to have some kind of, uh, of uh, others that we may internalize. So we create this other. Uh, this uh, this argument is one that reaches back to to with Levi Strauss and uh, the incest taboo. Uh, we need to have another group. We need to have A and Bs uh, because A need to to get uh, their spouses from the other group. We need not to. Uh, we should have this. Uh, uh, exchange uh, and this is uh, that's the, the the idea behind this uh, but I think that we can also refine it in another way that maybe we need to have A and B in order to be able to to take the other's point of view by ingesting it by by a uh, by taking it, it uh, taking it in, uh, so uh, so that we gain the perspective from outside of ourselves, onto back to on, uh, ourselves. Um, so that was uh, the idea with this uh, quote, and let me just give another example of this. Uh, because now it's, I know that we're just jumping uh, from one, one ritual with night dance onto the hunt, now onto something completely different. But this is also part of the, and a very important part of the women's rituals uh, among the Hatsa. This is a, an Auntenakwete. This is a calabash gourd that was one of the things, one of the three items that James Woodburn addressed as children in his uh, 1970 
report. Um, and this, along with a doll, and we see, oh, I just jumped very quickly. This is a clay doll, and this stick. These three items are considered part of women among the Hatsa. These are aspects of the women. Uh, so that's also a very concrete way of extending human beings to uh, beyond the skin of yourself or inviting other kinds into your, your uh, idea about self. So um, we've got the stick and uh, a wooden stick, a clay doll and a calabash. Uh, that are all part of the of women uh, and I've it's really quite uh, complex how they are so but it's uh, all the things that they uh, uh, that they indicate or they what they what they uh, draw out as aspects of the women is always quite neat it's a uh, the stick is the past, the gourd is the is present, and the doll is the future. And we have these uh, quite neat um, ideas that are that fit very uh, nicely together uh, as uh, as uh, ideas behind these uh, these items. And this Narachanda stick is mostly uh, related to the the, uh, the girls' initiation ritual called the Maitoko. Uh, they would they should always bring the, their stick to this uh, this ritual, and uh, it's a uh, quite. Uh, Camilla, you have all also. Uh, Ex, you know, done uh, research on this, and it's a, uh, it's quite, uh, it's powerful, and it's it's a, it has a duration of time, uh, but it's it's playful and it's serious, and it it has all these uh, facets uh, that can that it uh, turns that it addresses and that it uh, gives uh, to to people. Uh, well, to people, to the, to the ones performing this uh, this ritual, um, and it involves a, a cutting, uh, which is quite strange. Uh, having a society which is uh, egalitarian and then has involves uh, a cutting uh, in in this uh, initiation ritual. Um, but it's, I, and I tr really try to ask quite a lot of uh, women about this and how come, or had they been, was was it something that they could not refuse to to have this cutting or, uh, but that would be, uh, they said no, I I choose to do this myself, um, but I would like to to dig further into this. Uh, into this ritual, um, yeah. We also see that it's not only the the adolescent girls that partake in this uh, ritual. Also, the girls not ready yet. They have rehearsals of this uh, this uh, ritual, and instead of wearing the beads that we saw, uh, the beads and the the narachanda, they are smeared with the. They have this ashes that is mixed with the water, but special ashes. It's ashes from the hearth um, that are, is then drawn on their bodies, and they ran around with the with the the mitokos. Uh, it was quite quite interesting. Um, and this is what's going on. We really have all these men who are 
they are like prey <laughs> suddenly <laughs> during this my talk or they they dance around being light footed and uh, and the women you can see come charging with uh, very powerfully with the narichanda high in the air ready to punish and to whip uh, if she gets the chance and we've got this heavy flirting going on in the ritual it's and we have we can see when the ritual is on the women will will wear the beads across the, across the chest so at night late at night then they can take them them off and then the ritual is uh, on pause so but it's a, a very striking uh, reversal of uh, of roles and uh, and it's so uh, amusing to be part of really um the women are hunters but they're hunting men yeah yes exactly and they should they sh uh, there's this uh, idea that the women once they get to the men they should whip mercilessly it's really I was, I was heavy beating i was considered old enough to be harmless so yes they but then they can exactly yes but that's also where you know where the flirting is up uh, yep um i would just end by by uh, also uh, introducing that there are gods uh, actual mountain gods that are uh, part of the Hatsa cosmology uh, that you they could go to these uh, these god cliffs and uh, make requests demand sharings saying give me a kudu and the god will have to give you a kudu uh, and it's uh, so it's not like this uh, christian uh, attitude of uh, please and oh i'm so uh, i'm not worthy this is really you know give me a kudu and you you have the entitlement and the god should obey you uh, so <laughs> it's a, it's quite a, another uh, idea of a god um, but it's also and it has a shadow side this uh, uh, this obeys because of course the god is also this powerful uh, being this powerful mind that will have the possibility of of uh, crushing you uh, on a whim it's just it's really it has this uh, double to it uh, that so many things that among, among the Hatsa does there's this there's the face value and then we find the opposite just just when you scratch the surface uh, so this is uh, just to say that we also have regular gods uh, where the where the dead where the spirits of the dead reside uh, in these uh, mountains and the god will send them out to do different chores um, to take care of the animals to give uh, the hungry hyena uh, the prey that the hunter just left uh, and maybe forgot to, or maybe he didn't maybe he did everything right but the hyena just simply needed this uh, meat so the the spirits will make sure that the hyena finds this uh, this prey so they have all these uh, tasks that and the god has all these uh, uh, care it's cares for so for so many both uh, humans and uh, animals um, and here we are on the god which was kind of a, a, a dif difficult uh, thing I was invited to, to come to the god uh, just after they had uh, agreed to, to give me some in uh, give me information on this esoteric knowledge that is not supposed to be shared so uh, and just as they agreed they say oh by the way would you like to come visit vi to visit the god i was just yes yeah, uh, I, and i didn't see the connection uh, at that point but being invited to the god 
was of course also to check if it would be okay if they gave me this knowledge and the test was if I survived so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that I did but it was quite it was a really uh, it was really a test it was the f only time that I felt sick was the night before and uh, it was a, it was such a strange uh, day that we had and uh, it was I almost didn't make it but eventually I did and uh, once I, I climbed the mountain everything every hardship that I had had during that day it simply disappeared so it, it had this very strange um, or mystic uh, side to it too um, yes well, I just wanted to say this is just about communication and this is about telling the stories that matter to people and hoping that somebody will listen. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>